It is now time for question time. To the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development. We start with listed questions and we will return to Mr Atwood after question time. I call Mr William Irwin. Mr. Speaker. My department has prepared a draft BVD legislation which has been approved by the EU Commission and which is ready to be subjected to the legislative processes here. Before I can introduce such legislation, Animal Health and Welfare and I need to demonstrate that they have sufficient private sector funding to enable them to maintain and the implementation of the eradication program without the need for further public funding. This is important not only because of the pressures obviously available um, on public funding, but also because of the need for industry to lead in tackling this production disease. I understand that significant progress in this issue has been made recently, and Animal Health Welfare and I has presented a draft of their viability and sustainability plan, which is being considered by officials. I have, all, I have also um, have to be satisfied that Animal Health and Welfare NI will be responsible for the implementation of aspects of the legislation, has an IT system that is fit for this purpose. While the current system has been adequate for the administration of the voluntary BVD programme, it is not yet sufficiently robust to enable the introduction of legislation. Animal Health and Welfare NI is currently working with its database provider to resolve these issues. I would like to highlight the amount of work being taken forward by Animal Health and Welfare NI in conjunction with my officials in order to facilitate making the BVD eradication programme compulsory. In many respects, this project has been breaking new ground and, of course, has presented a number of challenges which have taken time to work through. I would also like to highlight the positive contribution that the industry, both the dairy and the beef sectors, are making to this um, ongoing work. I am hopeful that any remaining issues can be successfully um, resolved shortly and that I will be in a position to legislate later this year. Call Mr. Irwin for supplementary. Can I thank the Minister for a response? Does the Minister accept that there is frustration in the industry over the length of time it is taking to get this scheme up and running? Yes, as I said, uh, the trend to get to a stage where we have a compulsory scheme has not been without its challenges, but this is very much is an industry led initiative. However, we are very supportive and, and are working um, with the industry and been able to get us to the stage we are now. I am pleased that we are. Um, have just recently received the viability plan from, um, industry, from Animal Health and Welfare NI. Things look good and I would be hopeful the fact that we would be able to move forward now and move to introduce the legislation, which we have already had that approved by the EU. Um, so so we are actually, um, in terms of the department's role, we are steps ahead. We are just wanting to make sure the viability plan uh, and sustainability plan is in place and that we have um, everything set out that allows us to take this um, staged approach to be able to tackle BVD. Call Mr. Cattle Boylan. Uh, Gar Morgan, I approve the ask and call. Thank you, Mr. Principal <coughs> Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister how successful has the uptake of the voluntary scheme been? For a minute, Since the scheme um, commenced on the 1st of January 2013, over 4,000 herd keepers have joined the scheme and have been with them, um, and have between them purchased just over 400,000 tags and test kits. This has resulted in over 300,000 test um, results being uploaded onto the database with 289,000 being found to be negative. The level of persistently infected bovines found is 0.51% of tests, which is about 1,500, and a further 1% as yet unknown. Ms. Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. As we know, the Minister announced um, to great departmental fan for two years ago, she was going to legislate for compulsory BVD testing. Can the Minister provide an update on the latest estimated costs to farmers per applicable animal and this, if the scheme were to become compulsory? I do not have those figures on me and the, the member will be aware that we did announce it in fanfare and I still will speak about it in those terms. This is a, um, an, an industry approach to try and tackle a production disease. I think that it is important that we move towards um, tackling production disease as opposed to just um, diseases after the fact. This is very much a preventative approach which will help um, uh, improve farmers' um, productivity from their animals. So I think that the fact that there has been teasing problems are as a result of industry problems, not a result of DARD problems. The department has the legislation on, on the table. We have had it approved by the EU. But as, as, um, until I bring the legislation forward, I needed to be assured that the industry could respond to what has been set out in the legislation. We have been working our way through that. I am confident now that the industry has actually produced a sustainability plan that looks very positive, and I think that that will allow us to be able to um, bring forward and go through due process in terms of this House on bringing that legislation forward before the end of this year. Call Mr. Raymond McCartney. Our guest, Everett O, led the whole question number two. 
The Rural Micro Capital Grant Scheme has just closed for applications last Friday, the 22nd of May. So you'll appreciate that it's pretty early to give any definitive view on the quality or range of applications. However, what I can say is that the rural support networks have been extremely busy dealing with inquiries and calls in advance of the application deadline. I understand that over 450 applications have been submitted and that the eligibility screening process um, will start immediately with the intention of working towards issuing letters of offer to successful applicants by July. As members will already know, um, financial support of up to £1,500 per application is available for selected projects and this is intended to encourage rural community and voluntary groups to improve and to develop their facilities and their assets, which in turn will contribute to improved community engagement within the local area. I anticipate that over 150 rural community organisations will directly benefit from the initial 200,000 set aside within my Tackling Rural Poverty and Social Isolation budget for this scheme. This new, scheme, uh, this new programme represents an excellent opportunity for community groups to build on their existing roles, strengthening community engagement and improving the lives of those living in rural areas. The response so far would suggest this programme would have a tremendous impact on our rural areas. Call Mr. McCartney for a supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. McCartney. Thank you very much, Mr. McCartney. Thank you very much, Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for her answer? Can the Minister perhaps give us some uh, outline or some detail on how the successful projects will be selected and what sort of criteria she will be using for them? The programme, as I said, opened on the, or maybe didn't say, opened on the Monday, the 13th of April and closed on the 22nd of May. And in order to reduce the administrative burden and the application processing times, once an application is screened um, against the programme's eligibility checklist, there's no secondary assessment process. So that speeds the whole um, grant scheme up. Each um, rural support network has been advised of their grant allocation to fund projects in their area. And all eligible al applications up to the allocation threshold for the area can be awarded funding. In the event of the network being oversubscribed, then selection will be um, through the use of random selection, which will be undertaken in an appropriate venue open to attendance by applicants. Actual selection will be undertaken by an individual who is independent from the entire process, and selection will be verified um, by attendant DART officials. Random, um, just to say, random selection is not a first come, first serve process. No grant awards will be made until the call for applications is closed and all applications within the relevant network area have been screened for eligibility. And I expect that letters of offer will issue before July 2015. Call Mr. Basil McRae. Question number three, please. AFBE have received 246 eligible applications from staff interested in exiting via the Voluntary Exit Scheme. Call Mr. McRae for a supplementary. Uh, does the Minister have any idea how many of such applicants will be successful in uh, getting the voluntary uh, redundancy? I don't have those figures now. Obviously, AFBE has to work through um, its processes in terms of um, bidding into the scheme to be successful. Um, suffice to say that AFBE um, are working very hard in terms of their strategic plan for 2020 and I'm working very closely with them just to set out um, their priorities for, for the um, years ahead, particularly around research, development, innovation and, and I want to work very closely with them to make sure that we arrive at a sustainable plan for AFBE to have a successful and thriving AFBE into the future. Well, Mr Joe Byrne. Principal Deputy Speaker, can the Minister state will the voluntary exit scheme for AFBE in relation to the cutbacks be able to be self-financing or will there be extra monies available to AFBE to warrant and pay for the scheme? The AFBE will be able to bid in as the same as other um, departments and arms length bodies in terms of the voluntary exit scheme that's been taken forward um, across the executive. Um, as I said, uh, obviously um, we're under challenge in economic circumstances uh, and AFBE have um, very clearly been set out uh, a challenge and a task to actually look at how they're going to be sustainable into the future. We want to have a thriving AFBE. I want to um, work with them and I have done so over the last um, period of time to make sure that what they bring forward is something that will create a sustainable AFBE um, and the strategy is set out into 2020. We have that paper near in finalisation and that um, also looks at um, the cost of savings that AFBE could achieve. It looks at, at income generation, which AFBE could achieve, particularly around increasing EU receipts. So I'm going to consider all those package proposals very carefully before coming to final decisions, just in terms of the future direction and, and um, how, we'll, how we'll envisage that AFBE will work. Call Mr Roy Beggs. 
Principal Deputy Speaker. The Minister has referred to her application to the Voluntary Redundancy Scheme. She will, however, be aware that her party's opposition to welfare reform means that that scheme, which was dependent on welfare reform, is likely not to be available. So can she advise us if she has any funding within her department to pay for a voluntary redundancy scheme, or will she have to over overlook a compulsory redundancy scheme? Well, I'm not going again to speak in what ifs. Unless the member has a crystal ball, I don't think he can definitively say what happens next. The scheme is going forward as, it, as is at this moment in time. If there are changes to that, then we'll have to look at all of that. Call Mr. Jim Allister. Minister say of the 246, what percentage of AFP staff that represents? And in particular, does it ease the foolish agenda to try and close the cross Crossnacrivi testing station? Uh, and is the minister hoping to hide behind that as a means to deliver that austerity measure? I don't attempt to hide behind anything. But I, can, um, I don't have the percentage figure either. 246 um, is, is the total number that have applied. In terms of um, AFB's plans, they were considering around 200 people going out in the voluntary exit scheme. That is all part of what I've already um, stated around their sustainability plan and AFB up into 2020, the strategic plan which we've asked them to develop. AFB is, is, ha, has uh, many an opportunity to look towards um, increasing their income, particularly from um, EU drawdowns, particularly from the fact that the executive has a target to increase our drawdown under Horizon 2020. So for me, there are um, plenty of opportunities for AFB to look towards increasing um, their income. They've been able to do it down through the years in terms of increasing um, significantly their income, which has helped them to be sustainable. Given the um, economic climate that we find ourselves in, the financial constraints that we find ourselves in, um, particularly in relation to the Tory cuts to the Black Grant and the implications that that has for arm's length bodies. Um, it's so important more than ever that um, AFB um, has a very clear vision about where they're going and I'm, I'm working with them. As I said, their 2020 strategy paper is nearing um, finalisation and that includes, as I said, AFB's costed savings proposals to show how it plans to live within its budget. It's, um, it's also around, um, as I said, increasing drawdowns and it's about, about um, identifying priorities and areas of work that will really help the industry, particularly in relation to research innovation. Well, Mr. Edwin Poots. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Does the Minister recognise that both Scotland and the Republic of Ireland are pouring more resource into research in agriculture? And the attack that the Minister has made on AFBE is actually an attack on the entire agriculture community, as it will not uh, achieve the sustainability if it does not have the quality research that AFBE currently provides. And they will not be able to uh, replace the core funding. Um, through the other means that the Minister blandly points out, um, and that will do substantial damage to AFP as a consequence. I can only continually repeat myself. Um, there's certainly been no attack in relation to um, AFP. I've been working, as I said, very closely with AFP. I think there's a lot of misconception out there, and I've heard of figures that are un incorrect in terms of reductions to their, to their budget. Um, I understand there's been a figure in the ether around 26% uh, has, has been quoted in relation to cuts to AFP, which is um, very much not the case. On a like-for-like -like basis, um, when you use the same methodology employed by the department and across the public sector, reduction to AFP's budget is about 11.5%. And when you compare that against um, a cost, AFP's overall cost base, that reduction actually only equates to 7.5%. So whilst I don't um, underestimate the challenges that that creates for AFP, just because something has always been done a certain way doesn't mean that's the way we continue to do it for the future, so, which is why they've been tasked and why I've worked very closely with AFB in terms of looking at what is the future direction for them, how can we work together, how do we create a sustainable, thriving AFB, because it's not in anybody's interest, it's not in the interest of the agricultural industry to see a failing AFB. I want them to be successful and I'm happy to continue to work with them. We have a strategy in place now, we have a plan, and as I said, that's nearing completion. Well, Ms Rosie McCorley. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, can she elaborate any further on AFP's strategic plan for post-boundary exit? Yes, I think it will all um, come back to, um, the, again, the issue around the strategic plan and the fact that we are coming towards the end of completing that plan. And that will very clearly set out AFP's cost and savings proposals to show how it plans to live within its available budget for 15-16 and up until the end of the decade. I'm going to consider the package of proposals very carefully before coming to a final decision on its implementation. And as I said, none of us can continue to do things the same. 
we, we need to prioritise what we do, we need to consider um, stopping certain things, and we need to find more efficient ways of getting things done. Particularly for AFPI, we need to look at um, how we can increase their drawdown of European funding. And I've clearly see, very clearly set them out um, challenging targets, but I do believe that um, they're certainly up for that and that the board are working very hard to make sure that they do maximise their drawdown of um, external funding outside of what um, the department allocates to them, which is quite a significant um, body of work. I don't have the exact figure with me, but I think it's close to um, £40 million pounds of, of, of funding. So that's the priority, um, and it very clearly shows that there's um, a will within the department to um, focus on research, innovation, and, and, and I'll continue to be able to do that. And I've very clearly, as I said, set out my stall in terms of wanting to work with, the, with AFPI to make sure we prioritise the work for the time ahead. Well, Ms. Maeve McLaughlin. I've got uh, question number four. Following a full reassessment audit by SGS um, Qualifier, an internationally recognised certification body, I'm pleased to report that the Forest Service management system has been assessed and certified as meeting the requirements of a well-managed forest against standards recognised by the Forest Stewardship Council. The certification process recognises the importance of timber production along with its environmental and social requirements. The impact of this is significant for the, tim the timber industry. Last year it added over 50 million of value to the economy. In environmental terms, obtaining forest management certification provides independent, ev independent evidence that forest service plans and operations are maintaining and enhancing biodiversity of our forest ecosystems. The certificate is also important for tourism. Visitors want to know that forests are being properly managed and that plans for cutting and replanting operations comply with the highest standards. Ms McLaughlin for a supplementary. Good. And can I thank the Minister for that detail uh, in her answer? Can I ask, has the Minister considered maybe further exploiting the potential of our forest protectorate in terms of tourism and recreation? Yes, the, an assessment of the potential for forestry tourism development opportunities was jointly commissioned by the Tourist Board and Forest Service and confirms that some of our forests are strategically important within tourism destination areas because they have the potential to hold visitors as part of a longer visit. The outcomes of that study have underpinned the decision by the executive to invest four million in forestry tourism projects, collectively known as the Forestry Fund. That work is nearing completion, and many forests have benefited through the improvement um, to poor quality and outdated tourism and recreation-related infrastructure. The Forest Fund also identified a need to establish a baseline of forest visitor figures in terms of numbers and profile. As a result, a forest visitor survey has been recently completed, and a key outcome will um, include information on the economic value generated by these forest visits. The final report is currently being assessed and I'm confident this survey will provide a clear evidence base for the value of um, forest tourism. The information gathered by the survey will also provide an important aid to future recreation and tourism investment considerations and partnership working arrangements. Our forests offer a unique opportunity and attracting, uh, and attracting more visitors will have a positive impact on the economy of rural areas across the north. Well, Mr. Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Does the Minister believe that Forestry Service currently has the flexibility or the ability to maximise its revenue raising potential, either through timber sales, asset sales, or even land leases? Yes, I think that um, the Forest Service have been very, uh, have come a long way from what they've done in, in years gone by. I think the fact that we have the whole social recreational use of forests now, I think that the, in terms of working in partnership with councils, we've seen many examples of um, very positive working. But also alongside that, the Forest Service um, has, has significant um, income generation in terms of um, the timber, and there's been no issues identified to me in terms of challenges or, or issues that need to be identified. But if the member wishes to raise things with me outside of question time, I'm very happy to, to receive them because it's so important that we maximise the receipts um, from Forest Service. And um, I continually, as I said, um, engage with the Forest Service Chief, Chief Executive in terms of um, challenges and opportunities that are there. But we certainly are, are not coming across sort of major issues in terms of um, barriers to, to potential income generation. But as I said, happy to talk to the member if he has any specific issues. Call Mr. Sean Roy. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and thanks, Minister, for your answers thus far. Minister, in the Republic, they have plans with their new uh, forestry programme to plant over 8,000 hectares over the next 10 years. What expansion plans have DARD got in terms of forestation and in terms of creation of woodland? Um, I will refer the member to the DARD website. We have um, very clearly set out our plans in terms of um, targets for um, planting. 
We have our um, grant data systems to help people um, to, to plant out, but I don't have the actual details and the targets with me, but I'm very happy to provide that to the member in writing. But um, not, and not to say it's not without its challenges in terms of the targets that have been set and where we've got, but the challenges um, or the, the targets that were set, um, I think, run up into 2020, but I'll provide that to the member in writing. Call Mr Gregory Campbell. Number five, Deputy Speaker. Uh, with your um, permission, can I will answer questions 5 and 14 together. Um, as discussed at a recent meeting of the Executive, OFM DFM are taking forward the sale of the site, with the exception of the 8.7 acres that has been earmarked for headquarters and the 85 acres on the lower site that has been set aside for NI Water. My officials are working closely with colleagues in OFM DFM on matters relating to our relocation. OFM DFM has confirmed that the announcement of Dard's HQ move to the Ballykelly site has generated more interest in the site. OFM DFM has represented, um, are represented on the programme board that is in place to provide the strategic direction for Dard's relocation programme. A plan and application for a new headquarters at Ballykelly was submitted to the Causeway Coast and Glens Council on the 30th of April this year. The plan and application is for both the building and for the new access road required to service the building. A series of enabling works and studies are currently being undertaken at the site and are due to be completed by the end of May. A transportation assessment has been carried out, which concludes that the proposed access road meets the requirements of the new headquarters. Um, my officials have commissioned DFP's land and property services to acquire the land for the proposed access road. My officials are now working on completing the full business case and I expect that, that to be completed by November of this year with a view to awarding the contract for construction in December of this year, with construction beginning as planned in May of next year. My officials are also working with the DFP colleagues to uh, identify suitable temporary accommodation in the North West. This will help facilitate the transition and help to ensure that, that um, the Department continues to provide the full range of service to the high standard expected throughout the period of transition. Well, Mr Campbell for supplement. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, <coughs> would the Minister be aware that the delay and possible derailing of the welfare reform project which we're discussing today puts at risk not just the thousands of jobs at Ballykelly but the other thousands of jobs at the Mays site and the tens of thousands of jobs all in the private sector that could be created through the corporation tax reduction? I don't want to get drawn in again. I don't think, it's, um, I don't think you need to play welfare reform against DART um, headquarters moving to Ballykelly. The member will know that I have fought very hard for a better distribution of public sector jobs. That continues to be the case. These jobs moving into the North West um, is a major win for the North West in terms of construction, in terms of the ongoing service in the building, in terms of a fair distribution of public sector jobs. That continues to be the case. I'm um, going to continue on this journey. We have um, come a long way in terms of getting us to where we are now. The plan and application submitted. I'm going to continue to make sure that we deliver on Dart HQ headquarters, headquarters, headquarters moving into the North West because I believe this is the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do for the public service. And I think it's a nonsense to start to play welfare reform against Dart HQ. Oh, Mr. Cathal Oshin. Uh, I've got a brief last can I ask the Minister, does she have a time frame uh, for the delivery of the plan and application process so that there can be no delays in the delivery of the entire project uh, essential for the North West? Yes, on the 30th of April this year, we had a plan and application which was lodged with the new council, the Causeway Coast and Glens Council, for the design of the new headquarters. Um, this application also includes details of the new access road requirements. Consultations um, have been ongoing throughout the design development process between both my design team and other statutory bodies such as Planning Service, the Environment Agency and Transport NI, as well as the Ministerial Advisory Group on Architecture. The building has been sited and designed to minimise the impact on the surrounding landscape with particular focus on the nearby church. The exterior of the building has been designed so as to integrate appropriately into this rural setting with extensive use of granite, stone and bronze cladding. The building will be constructed in two phases with the completed building measuring 6,600 um, 6, metres squared. The building will provide modern office accommodation for DARD staff and will be built to government office standards, making full use of open plan spaces and modern working pra practices. Plan and service work to a 12-week target and we expect this to be completed by August of this year. We will then proceed to the invitation to tender stage with a view to awarding a contract for the construction of the building by December of this year. Call Mr John Dallet. Principal Deputy Speaker, I welcome the Minister's response. I uh, welcome the uh, idea of uh, her department coming to Ballykelly. The Minister, would she agree with me that this is only a tiny part 
of a 900-acre site, and in her discussions with the Office of the First and the Deputy First Minister and others, can she please explain to this House why they are only scurrying about this week talking about a master plan for a site that has the potential to create hundreds, if not thousands, of jobs? And finally, could the Minister tell us where else in the world would you have a site like that with an airport beside it, a railway running through it, and a main road going past it? And there's still no master plan, still no economic uh, task force set up. What is happening? Well, can I, uh, well, I welcome the, the member's positive um, commentary in relation to um, the move to Ballykelly and the benefits that that will bring. And I, I know he's a consistent supporter of, of the move. I think that uh, well, it's very clear the executive um, have responsibility for OFMDF in particular, have responsibility for the wider site. The fact that DARD has become the anchor tenant, I think, has very clearly um, led to more um, significant interest in the site, which is something that is obviously very positive and something that we welcome. The executive have, have set out their stall in terms of needing to move to secure investment in the wider, in the wider site over the last um, maybe over the last month or so, I think they've very clearly set out their stall in terms of what they want to achieve and the benefits of moving um, quickly. The fact that the, the OFMDFM did a soft marketing test not very clearly set out that there are so many um, businesses out there that, I can't remember the number, but have sign expressed significant interest in the site in itself. The potential is um, fantastic. You're right, the location itself is fantastic. Um, there are so much potential, particularly from the railway halt and all the other um, um, potential um, Tra travel um, methods to, to that area, I think, that um, are, are second to none. So it's for, for me, my main interest is in terms of um, securing the headquarters on the site, and as, I, as I've um, outlined in previous answers, we're clearly on target to be able to deliver on that. Ms. Over in. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, setting aside the Minister's shameful actions to date on this issue, not least the blatant disregard for public money, uh, does the Minister think the proceeds or some of the proceeds of the sale of surplus land could be put into a, a community fund for the Roe Valley? Well, maybe the member doesn't understand. When the site is sold off, it's an executive sale. It won't come into DARD, so it will not be my um, individual responsibility. It will be an executive responsibility as to how the money is, uh, is spent. In terms of my regard to public money, um, I have very clearly set out my stall in terms of why we need to have a relocation project. I'm very clearly set out my stall as to why uh, and to the benefits of moving um, the headquarters into, um, into the northwest. I've also very clearly set out uh, the benefits as to why forestry would go into Fermanagh and why um, Rivers Agency would go into Lockery and Cookstown in the member's own constituency, but maybe she thinks that's a bad spend of money, but she can answer to the electorate in terms of that. So we have very clearly set out um, the, the benefits of public spend, of spending public money in this way, the fair distribution of public sector jobs, the construction um, jobs that it will create, the long-term economic benefits that it creates, particularly if you take Bally Kelly with the increased footfall into a small area. So the benefits to me um, very clearly um, way up in terms of the spend of public money. Call Ms. Karen McCabe. Well, Deputy Speaker, question six. Since the European Commission's comments on the draft Rural Development Programme 2014 20 were received on the 31st of March of this year, my officials have been engaged in a process of negotiation with the Commission to address the comments raised and gain approval for our programme as quickly as possible. These negotiations have included seven video conference meetings with Commission officials in Brussels and one face to face meeting. So far, our um, ANC scheme as submitted in the draft programme has been informally approved by DG Agri with minor technical amendments. We are hopeful of receiving um, informal approval for more schemes shortly. Once the Commission's comments have been addressed to their satisfaction, the full draft programme will be um, resubmitted formally for <coughs> approval. It will then begin a period of inter service consultation with the Commission. Formal Commission approval for the programme should be received by July of this year or September at the very latest. In the interim, my officials are continuing to work on the necessary business cases and the design of schemes so that we can start to open schemes once the EU and business case approvals are in place. I call Ms McAvitt for a supplement. It's my Deputy Speaker. Minister, it is generally believed uh, that we are the last region to agree um, to the new Rural Development Programme scheme. Uh, can the Minister advise if any rural groups are at a disadvantage uh, because of this delay and what protections will her department give to the groups uh, to help deliver on their schemes? 
Well, it's untrue to say that the majority of other member states have had their programmes approved because that's not the case. The Commission, I think, underestimated the fact that they'd have to deal with an influx of all the applications coming forward last year. So they're struggling in terms of being able to turn those around and actually get approvals out. So the reality is we're not at the bottom of the pile. We are, I've, I've um, noticed that today in the 26 counties have actually just had their program approved, which is something obviously welcome. But um, in terms of our approval, we're working consistently with the Commission. As you can see from what I've said, there's been an ongoing engagement with the Commission and we're hopeful to get to have our approvals over the next number of months. That being said, alongside that work that's being done and tidying up everything with the Commission, we, um, my officials are drafting up schemes. We're actually getting things moving. We, um, for example, invited applications for the agri-environment schemes under um, on, when people made their claim for single farm payment for the deadline of the 15th of May, even though we've only had informal approval of that scheme. So we're not letting anything um, sit. We're making sure that we're um, going to have the programmes open and ready. You'll know that um, rural groups are actually still, alloc are still receiving funding, um, but I'm very anxious that we learn from the lessons of the previous programme, that we don't have a slow start, that we get things moving. And the only way we can do that is whenever we have official sign-off from Europe. But in the meantime, we have a whole body of work to get on with. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to topical questions. The member listed for topical question one has withdrawn their name. I call Mr. Basil McRae. I wonder if the minister could uh, tell us her position on rural broadband provision. Yes, um, the member will be aware that the responsibility for broadband is uh, a priority of um, the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment. However, um, I've been very keen to insert myself and make sure that we try to work and plug the nut spots uh, in relation to um, service provision. Anyone who lives in a rural area will be, will be very alert to the, the frustration that's felt by um, businesses, but also families for children, for studying, etc. Um, if, you, if you can't get a connection or you've got a slow connection, then it, it's quite frustrating. So my department has invested £7.5 million in rural broadband um, over the last um, number of years, and we've um, assisted 1,700 households to be able to get a connection. Um, and, and I have done that through my tackling poverty and isolation um, package of funding, and we'll continue to, to work with Daddy in making sure that we do plug the gaps. Mr McRae for a supplement. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, would you accept, though, that there is huge frustration throughout the rural parts of our um, country that they cannot get what they consider to be an essential uh, utility for modern living? and that perhaps it's something that the Department of Rural Development should actually take on board to, to drive rather than just leaving it to the techies? Well, I think I've just answered that in that I've said that it is very frustrating if you live in a rural area and you can't get a connection. It is the responsibility of the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment who have um, contributed significantly in terms of broadband right across the board. My intervention was merely for the fact that rural communities are frustrated who don't have a connection or have too slow a connection to make any difference. That is why I've, I've invested £7.5 million pounds from the Tackle and Poverty and Isolation um, pot of funding. But it's also why um, we've also, as I said, been significant in that we've been able to address 1,700 households. However, if you're in, um, still in an area where you can't get a connection, it's only natural that you're going to be frustrated. Um, I can certainly give an assurance from, term, from my department's point of view. I'll continue to work with Daddy in terms of um, plugging the knot spots and trying to address speed issues in other areas. Well, Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Principal Deputy Speaker, thank you. Maybe the uh, Minister could give the House an update on the number of young farmers who have uh, applied for a claim for a top up to the basic payment. I don't have that figure with me. I'm happy to, to write to the member. We had two and a half, almost two and a half thousand um, young people that actually applied to take part in the course, the Caffrey Run course. So that in itself was um, extremely significant, um, even um, exceeded the expectations of the department in terms of the numbers that will come forward. So um, two and a half thousand, how many of those actually translated into um, applications? I'm not sure. The deadline has just passed on the 15th of May. Um, so uh, we'll be able to assess that over the next number of weeks. Mr. Nesbitt, first step. Uh, thank the minister uh, and, and would welcome uh, written confirmation. Uh, the minister you had previously said that the top up payment would be based on 25 per cent. Uh, of the total direct payments average per hectare, which I think is around about €84. Euro. So, given your previous answer, I wonder if the Minister can uh, give some assessment of the financial implications uh, of that. Um, yes, you're right in that €84 Euros per hectare was the estimated figure which we thought we'd be looking at. However, it was very dependent on the numbers that came forward. 
It also was in the numbers that came out of the scheme. So um, until, we have, until we have the final numbers, I don't want to put out a figure there that um, either raises expectations or lowers expectations in terms of um, the actual final payment. It, as I said, it's very dependent on the final numbers of applications that came forward. Well, Mr Gregory Campbell. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister outline where her department is at in terms of the country of origin labelling in the sheep sector? Yes, it's, it's an ongoing issue which um, we're um, attempting to get to the bottom of. The member will be aware that um, country of origin labelling came into effect in April, um, but even prior to that, as far back as last year when we were dealing with the nomadic issue, um, now we have the lamb issue. I'd be, I would be concerned about what this means for all the other sectors in the time ahead. So we've been working, um, monitoring recent developments very closely. I'm doing everything within my power in terms of being able to address the issue. I have um, had conversations with um, Minister Coveney in the 26 counties. I've had conversations with DEFRA in England. We've had conversations with Phil Hogan, the European Commissioner. And I've actually um, written to DG Agri, DG Competition um, in, in Brussels in terms of um, being able to get to a position where we can agree a voluntary label, which could be used by this industry and other industries in the future, if needs be. Because this is a labelling issue which um, is something that I believe that we can have a resolution to if there's a will and a way. Both, there's certainly a will within the industry. Um, we need a will within the, the actual buyers, so the likes of the, of the big companies that actually ask for, for, for particular issues, particular labels on, on their products. Mr. Campbell, for supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister outlined a series of conversations she's been having. While she's been having these conversations, farmers have seen prices go down, decline significantly in recent months. How long does she believe it will be before she starts to see those prices recovering, principally as a result of the labelling saga? Well, obviously pricing is an issue outside the department's remit. It is a commercial issue, but um, suffice to say, if there are barriers there, um, if we don't have fairness in the supply chain, if we don't have conversations across the supply chain, people can't plan for potential ups and downs and fluctuations in prices. In terms of the country of origin labelling, it's my intention to have it resolved ASAP. This is the time now when... when um, farmers will be selling, so um, they're missing out the longer this goes on. I've made that very clear to um, both the European Commission, to DEFRA, and to Simon Coveney. I have tasked my, my permanent secretary to work, and Simon Coveney has done the same with his permanent secretary, around trying to find a solution. So it's in the best interest of our local industry that we do find that solution ASAP. Well, Mr Oliver McMullen. Can I ask the Minister to give us an update on her efforts to address rural crime? Yes, I'm pleased, or I'm very aware, I suppose, of the real um, concerns that the levels of crime are causing amongst the farming community, including um, the number of livestock thefts that have um, occurred on farms. I've met with the PSNA Chief Constable and the Minister of Justice on a number of um, occasions and made them aware of my concerns. I explained the real worry this was causing in rural areas and highlighted the need for something to be done. Responsibility for tackling rural crime lies primarily with the PSNA. However, DARD, through its veterinary service enforcement branch and CAFRI, works closely with the PSNA, particularly in relation to the detection, tracing and recovery of stolen livestock. I'm aware of some local PSN, PSNA initiatives to prevent rural crime, and these are to be welcomed. I am also aware of joint work being taken forward by the PSNA and Garda Shikana to combat crime in, in border areas. And I welcome this multi-agency approach, which recently has resulted in the recovery of stolen animals and in arrests and convictions in the north and in ongoing prosecutions in the 26 counties. And Mr McMullen for supplementary. Good, can I thank the Minister for a detailed answer? But can the Minister give us any details on her discussions with her counterparts regarding uh, fuel laundry and associated crime, particularly in the border areas? Good, my yes, um, I, I've actually recently had a, a conversation and meeting with um, the Minister of Justice, um, David Ford, in, in terms of the measures that have been taken forward right across the island to tackle fuel crime. Um, it's something that's absolutely 100% condemned and something that we need to continue to work together to resolve. Um, as I said, I think that the multi-agency approach, the Giarda and the PSNI working together, has been most effective. And um, certainly, whilst it's early to say, the new detection um, mechanism that's been inserted into the fuel, um, which has been taken forward by HMRC, um, we're hopeful that that will um, yield improvements in terms of, um, well, act as a deterrent in terms of um, people being able to, to, to actually um, launder the diesel and, and, and to do things like that. So I've raised it also with um, Simon Coveney at a recent NSMC meeting. So in terms of my responsibility, I'm very um, clear about making sure that we're um, to the fore of being able to do everything we can and my department will play its role in terms of, of tackling fuel fraud, but also rural crime in general. Well, Mr Mickey Brady. 
Well, I got the uh, pre last concordia. Can I ask the Minister to outline how our focus on rural broadband provision has benefited my constituencies in Uri Armagh? Gora Maigot. Yep, my department has now invested seven and a half million in rural broadband in total, and that's, um, this investment has already helped some 17,000 rural dwellers, farms, and businesses to access broadband services. The broadband improvements project, which is led by Daddy and to which I'm contributing five million, has been responsible for an additional 14,000 rural premises being able to connect to broadband if they wish. In the Newry and Armagh area specifically, 4,591 premises have been connected through this investment, giving rural dwellers in the area the same opportunities as those living in urban areas. Broadband is a priority of mine and I want to see all rural dwellers in the north being able to connect to broadband if they wish. So to that end, I'm investing a further £1 million in the broadband improvement project and allocating £2 million of the next rural development programme to tackle the harder to get at areas that still don't have access to broadband. I now want to encourage as many rural people as possible to make more and to make better use of broadband, and I have asked officials to carry out a scoping study to see how my department can encourage more and better use of broadband so that rural businesses and farmers can benefit from the wide range of government services that are now available online. Call Mr. Brady for supplementary. I thank the Minister for answer. Could I ask the Minister when all not spots will be connected? The additional funding from the Tripsy budget will help to reduce the number of NAT spots to around 20,000. Um, the broadband funds in the new rural development programme will also target those remaining NAT spots. Other government programmes are in the, pi the pipeline and these will also impact on the remaining NAT spots. Signing of contracts to take place once, businesses, um, once the business case has been approved and programmes um, approved, the target date would be mid to, the en to end May. But as I said earlier, I understand the frustration that's there within rural communities. We have made progress in reducing the number of people that can't get access to broadband. However, we still do have a way to go. Um, in terms of um, my contribution and to working with Daddy and the broadband improvement projects, I'm committed to doing that. And I very clearly set out um, my intention to invest additional funding in tackling um, broadband and trying to plug the, the gaps that are there. Well, Mr. Stephen Moudry. Uh, Mr. De Principal Deputy Speaker, does the Minister have any plans to introduce a new, more robust identification system for cattle to deter livestock thieves? No, I think the, the system that we have in place is, is, um, is, is a good system. Um, we certainly um, take a look at that in terms of um, the tackling rural crime and how we can address it together. One of the areas that is looked at is, is there an improvement um, that can be made to the tags. There hasn't been a recommendation um, coming forward from the industry of something that's workable for farmers, but also um, um, acts as a real deterrent. So outside of that, the focus, as I've said earlier, has to be around working collectively, multi-agency, um, across the island with the Gardaí and the PSNA. Mr. Moutry for supplementary. Thank you, and I, I thank the Minister for her response. But I can ask the Minister, would she be open to giving consideration to the freeze branding of the last three digits of ID numbers on cattle and making that mandatory? I actually, um, quite a number of years ago, um, was involved in launching a freeze brand project in, um, I think it was in Clochermark, possibly at that time, an um, initiative that was taken forward jointly with the PSNA. And for me, it, it did um, look like a very beneficial pro project and a, and a good way to go. However, there wasn't a lot of industry take up. So um, I'm always very happy to keep things under review. And if there was um, an initiative such as freeze brand, um, which has been piloted, as I said, but didn't have a great uptake, um, I'm always happy to look at that because if there's something that acts as, as a deterrent and it's easy for farmers to, to, to maintain and doesn't put a, um, a cumbersome burden on them, then I'd be very happy to look at it. Well, Mr. George Robinson. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, could the Minister outline what criteria her department uses to quantify the impact of the mixing slurry safely leaflet? I don't have that um, information with me, but I'm very happy to provide it to the member. It's all published on our website, but I'm, I'm very happy to, to get it sent to the member. Mr. Robinson, first supplementary. <clears throat> then, uh, would the minister agree that the impact of information regarding slurry safety must be investigated to ensure resources are being accurately targeted for best results? Yes, the, I will agree with the member in terms of. Um, in terms of farm safety and making sure that everybody plays their role. The health and safety executive are in the lead. My department plays a key role in terms of working collectively around making sure we highlight the dangers of, uh, that are on farm, particularly around slurry and the, and the um, issues and the devastating impact that that has, so I can give the member that assurance, surely. Mr Jerry Kelly is not in his place. I call Mr Stephen Agnew. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, could I ask the Minister, in relation to the BBC Spotlight 
programme on puppy farming. Do, does she believe that the problem is that the legislation is too weak or that enforcement has been inadequate? No, I think that it's fair to say that we have some of the strongest um, pieces of legislation, um, particularly when you compare us to England, Scotland, Wales and even um, the 26 counties. But I do, the member will be aware that I have given a commitment and we're, we have undertaken a review of our, of our legislation to see if there are um, ways that we can um, improve things. And there's a number of recommendations that have come forward um, as, as a result of that um, consultation. The member will also be, will know maybe that I've extended the deadline for um, to receive um, contributions to that, just given the, the, the recent publicity that there has been around dog breeding establishments. I think that our enforcement officers do, do a fine job. I think that um, in terms of you know, reports that are, that are made to them and the actions that they take. But if there's room, whilst I do think the legislation is um, strong, I do believe that there's always room for improvement in everything in life. And if there's something that we can do to um, improve the legislation that will help enforcement officers, then that's something that I'd be very much up for. Time is up. Uh, we